Episode 7 of the Interpretation Station is called to order. Please be seated. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a new episode on this date. It is today the 3rd of November, 2020. Rumour has it that there is uh, there's an important election going on in some country, somewhere in the world. Um, don't know too much of the details, but um, I'm sure it's very important. Anyway, just as a nod to that election, I just hope you notice my shirt here. This is actually my party shirt when I used to live in that country. Route 66 shirt. Got some of the big states. Illinois, Oklahoma, New Mexico. So that's all I'm going to contribute as far as that election in that country, whatever that is, is happening. Um, because I think, as you know, uh, forget, I mean, forget what they're showing on Fox News, forget what they're showing on CNN, on the BBC. The place to be here today, on November the 3rd, 2020, is the interpretation station. Much more interesting. Yeah. All 24 of my subscribers say so. So, yes. Um, well, while all that sort of thing is going on across the, uh, the channel, we here, uh, in the midst of uh, coronavirus lockdown again, here till the end of uh, November, another four weeks to go, um, we're going to be having some fun because today um, we're going to do some French today. And the country we're going to be focusing on is Mali. Uh, we have a recording provided us, to us today by uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Erin. Um, very good interpreter, excellent interpreter. And she's given us a statement by um, the special representative to the UN Secretary General on Mali, the SRSG, a Mr. Alun Pine. And yeah, he's going to be talking to us about the goings-on in Mali. His statement is from uh, 17th of June, uh, 2020. So before we go to the statement, the recording, and do it, let's just have a bit of an intro. Let's see what we all know about Mali. And uh, well, if you're anything like me, uh, until 2012, you'd probably heard very little about Mali. Now, I had heard of the place called Timbuktu in so far as being as a kid when you wanted to say a silly name of some place. If someone asked, where are you going? Well, I'm, I'm going to Timbuktu, aren't I? To be honest, I don't even know if I knew that Timbuktu was in Mali. Um, my, the vision I had in my head, let's say, of Timbuktu, of Mali, were these sort of... Um, Mud huts, if you like. You take a look at the screen. That's what I would have thought of Mali, perhaps. That would have been the uh, the extent of my knowledge. These rather funny buildings. Um, and they are apparently, you know, UNESCO World Heritage Site. Very famous. I'm sure it's a fascinating place to uh, to see. But anyway, suddenly, yes, in 2012, uh, suddenly Mali very much came into the news. Uh, and this was obviously in the wake uh, of the Arab Spring, uh, which is not unrelated, I think, to all the goings on there. Uh, now, to understand the, um, the situation in Mali, I've got a couple of maps to show you. Give you an understanding. So here's just your standard political map of uh, of Mali, former French colony, obviously. Uh, I guess the French pulled out probably in the 1960s, gave them independence when all these, all these countries were being carved up, this rather weird shape of the country. So there's your capital, Bamako, uh, that, 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 as I said, is the capital, and Timbuktu is up here, sitting, is it on the river, it's either on the river, I think it's on the river Senegal um, that it sits. Now, to understand the uh, the problems, current problems in Mali, um, I'm going to show you a different map now. 
Okay, I want you to take a look at this map here. This gives you a very simple idea of what the problem is. Azawad, you will see here. Yeah. There is, and there has been for some decades, a significant secessionist movement that would like Azawad, this part of the country, so we're talking geographically over half of the territory of Mali, to break away and set up its own independent state. Now, the majority of the population uh, in Azawad are the Tuareg. Uh, again, the Tuareg, until recently, I, well, my only knowledge of the Tuareg was as it being a mod, uh, one of the models of uh, it was a Volvo, the Volvo Tuareg. But uh, no, the Tuaregs are a nomadic people, and they make up the bulk of the population in Azawad. So I was wrong. So Timbuktu actually lies on the river Niger, as you can see here. And so, yes, yeah, so they, they, they've had this sort of low-level secessionist movement running for some decades. But it really got kick-started um, in 2012, uh, in the wake of the Arab Spring, where you had, so originally it was called the Mouvement National de la Libération d'Azawad, so the MNLA. Um, well, so with, in the wake of the Arab Spring, one of the critical f factors here was the, the goings-on in Libya. Uh, if you recall, when Gaddafi was toppled, creating widespread chaos in that part of the world, well, one, of the co one of the repercussions of that was the so-called missing uh, Libyan arsenals, the caches of weapons that basically just disappeared. They went missing into the desert, and no one really knows where they ended up. And that missing arsenal is said to contain thousands, I've seen anywhere from 3,000 to 20,000 um, weapons, in particular what are called um, man-pads. Um, that's an important little uh, acronym to know. So, man portable air defense systems, man pads. Um, those basically the the surface to air missiles, surface to surface missiles. Um, pretty destructive pieces of kit. Now it's believed that a lot of these filtered through to the various. Uh, armed groups um, in Mali and really served to spur their um, their insurgency and so taking you back again so 2012 this so they, this insert all these mm, you, conflicts all these fighting started in this Azawad area um, lots of members of the Mali armed forces were getting killed in various attacks and raids around the region. This led to a coup in the capital Bamako, um, where the former president, Mr. Traore, was um, overthrown and uh, replaced by Mr. So as I say, in 2012, you had all these raids going on, attacks up in this uh, part of uh, Azawad, led to a uh, coup d'etat in Bamako, uh, where the former president, uh, President Amadou Toure, uh, was replaced um, by the new president, a captain, an army captain, Amadou Sanogo. Um, anyway, this didn't have much... This had little effect on the situation, what was going on in Azawad. In fact, it, the, the fighting stepped up even more, to the point that it actually became a threat to international peace and security. Because by this point, you had many of these Azawad secessionists um, allying with the various Islamist extremist groups uh, operating in that region. Um, I think perhaps the best known is Akim al-Qaeda, in the Islamic Maghreb, 
but other groups too, Al Saladin. So they, they effectively entered into a sort of marriage of convenience. The Azawad guys were more secessionist nationalists in the outlet, and obviously you had the uh, Islamist extremists who, had, who wanted to um, establish Sharia. And I think um, it was the Islamist extremists that were, sort of had the upper hand in that relationship. And they, as I say, they started setting up Sharia through broad swathes of this territory of Azawad, at which point the international community, um, spearheaded by France, uh, decided that they needed to step in. So uh, the French launched uh, an operation, a counter-operation called Operation Serval, um, together uh, with the Malian authorities. And so within a few months, they, uh, they, more, they sort of restored some order, uh, both in the capital and, uh, and in Azawad. The next stage was you had, so the UN then set up, then the, the, the Security Council voted to send a peacekeeping mission to the territory uh, called MINUSMA, uh, Mission Intégré des Nations Unies uh, uh, pour la Stabilisation Mali, I believe it is. Uh, well, MINUSMA sort of has the unfortunate uh, distinction of being the currently the UN's deadliest peacekeeping mission, uh, in so much as the number of uh, UN peacekeepers that have been killed in attacks. It's uh, yeah, even though the situation I guess has improved since 2012, it's still pretty fraught things there. Now, just to bring you a bit more up to date, what the current situation now is. So, an important agreement was signed in 2015. 15th of May 2015, the Algiers Accords. And you've got basically three stakeholders uh, to these agreements. Um, you have obviously the Malian authorities on one hand. You have then a group called uh, La Plateforme. Now, the Plateforme is a sort of a group of... Um, an uh, a conglomeration of various armed groups that were operating uh, in the territory of Azawad who tend to lean more pro-government um, generally, but these alliances are very, tend to often are in a state of permanent flux. Uh, so you've got the government, the platform, and the third big stakeholder here involved is La Coordination, so the Coordination, again, is another sort of umbrella group bringing together a lot of uh, the Tuareg separatist groups who were obviously pro-independence. And um, as I say, so nominally you would think that the government and platform would be on the same side against coordination, the Coordination, but the platform and the Coordination sort of sometimes make uh, ad hoc alliances against the government as well. Um, so they are three main groups. Um, now, you, they're the three legitimate groups. The Islamist extremist groups are outside of these accords. They, they were not signatories to the Algiers Accords, so they remained outside the sort of framework there. And they are still pretty active, I believe. You know, you, you're, they're often, um, in fact, you'll hear about it in the statement coming up, various sort of raids, attacks, bombings conducted by uh, the extremist groups there. So the main act So another important actor in this, uh, this conflict in Mali is uh, ECOWAS, the Economic Community of Western African States, which are mainly... Uh, Mali's neighbours, countries such as uh, Burkina Faso, um, Senegal, um, they play a re leading role. You've got another, so that there's ECOWAS. You want to know that. You also have the East African states, just for general knowledge, have their own union as well, called the Economic Community of Eastern African States, or sorry, Central African States. I'm talking Central Africa, ECAS, ECOWAS, ECAS. These are acronyms you you are going to to come across. 
So uh, they're big players in this. That you know that that they're that they're try they're sort of leading a lot of the mediating efforts together with France. So the current French mission there. So the French have got still got troops there in Mali. It's and that operation is known as Operation Barkhane. So uh, all these things are going to be um, are going to be mentioned uh, in the statement that we're going to be doing. Now, just before we start the recording, I um, just want to show you an interesting source that is really helpful for stuff like this. You may have heard of it before. You may have come across it before. I don't know. Um, if you look at the screen here. So it's the good old CIA World Factbook. Um, CIA World Factbook. Um, it's actually a very good source. It's a very good source. Um, tells you all the main features about country, geography, people, and society, uh, as you can see. Uh, one thing that's a, a bit of a tip here. Okay, so you got, it gives you the introduction here. Tells you all the background, you know, Mali and colonial times, etc. By the way, just looking here, one thing that's crucial to understanding some of these African con uh, conflicts is down here. Okay, I'm just highlighting it there. Terrorist groups have exploited age-old ethnic rivalries between pastoralists and sedentary communities. Many of the civil wars, conflicts going on in Africa are based around this notion of the pastoralists or the nomads versus the sort of sedentary, the sedentary communities. I know for Darfur, for example, it's all about it's all seasonal where the sort of pastoral communities with their flocks and things they move around they move around going wherever the the land is i guess is best where it's most fertile and in those mass movements of pastoralists they inevitably run into the uh, sedentary communities and this is a source of great tension so this is really an, a crucial thing to have in mind when when doing african con conflicts in Africa really will help you understand what's at stake fundamentally in many of them. Um, other things that I always find that I find are very useful uh, uh, to, to know here. Um, the economy, what drives the economy in these countries. Often here, here you'll want to know you know, what the um, precious metals are, uh, uh, what are the main industries you see here, food processing, construction, phosphate, and gold mining. Again, that will also give you a big point. So if you don't have much time, I'm just saying, if you come into a meeting with a country that you're not too familiar with, you go to somewhere like this, look up, as I say, what the industries are, the main f um, mineral products that these countries have, and also agricultural products. What are the main sort of things that they export? Um, is also a big pointer. Like, it often com is it often comes up, you know, in terms of the economic uh, issues that lie behind given conflicts. So cotton millet. Big millet's a big staple in many African countries. Rice, corn, vegetables, peanuts. It can be often uh, a good thing to know just what the French uh, words are for this. For example, like peanuts, they will often talk about arachide. That's peanuts. Oh, that hit me once in my early, early on in my career. I hadn't got a clue what it was. But for example, so here I'm saying it. peanuts, arachide. I don't think it actually comes up in this, but it's, it's a useful one to know anyway. So, well, that's given you a bit of an introduction then uh, to Mali. I think we'll find out a bit more from the SRSG statement. And so, uh, without further ado, 
Uh, let's move on. Well, actually, just just before we move on, I almost forgot to say, before you start watching the rest of the video, the sort of academic part of the video, now is the time, a green bit of introduction, go to the description box. In the description box, you will find a link to the original recording, the original statement from the SRSG, and you will find a link to the hard copy of that statement. Record yourself doing a render uh, uh, an interpretation of the SRSG, record yourself, and download or print off the hard copy, and then watch the rest of the video, the academic part of the video, and see what things you've got right, see if there's a new things that you can learn from me. Um, that's the best way to go. So with that, let's move on to Erin's recording. Okay, so we're going to begin with the um, academic part of this episode. I've got a quick correction to make before we start, actually. This isn't the SRSG uh, to Mali. This is actually the independent expert on the human rights situation in Mali, Mr. Alun Dine. So just to clear up that confusion. Okay, so I've got, uh, well, Erin's recording here. So I'm going to play it through, usual thing. Stop at the interesting places, give you tips and so on. And uh, let's, let, let's see what we can glean, what useful things we can glean from this video. Okay, let's get things going. High Commissioner for Human Rights, distinguished members of the Human Rights Council, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great honour today to present to your August Council my second report on the human rights situation in Mali. I do so as the independent expert on the human rights situation in Mali, a role I assumed on the 1st of May 2018. Okay, I should just point out in this first section there's a few couple of things that he sort of adds as well, so it, won't go, it doesn't go 100% to the text, but 95%. Just a, this is all very straightforward stuff, and actually this, for this first part you'll, you'll see is uh, very slickly done. Um, it's, very, it's a very, it's a very good uh, rendering that uh, that Erin gives us. A couple of words might be of interest. J'ai l'insigne honneur. Just means it's my great honour. That's all. Don't worry too much about that word. Uh, it's my second report on the human rights situation in Mali. On ma qualité, you know, in my capacity. You can just say as. Actually, you can just say as the independent expert on the human rights situation, or in my capacity. At the end of my fourth and fifth missions to Mali in November 2019 and February 2020, I visited the capital, the centre of the country, namely the region of Mopti and the north of Mali. Okay, so just a couple of these places that we mentioned. So Mopti, where there's quite a bit of fighting going on. As And, well, Timbuktu, the famous place, and Kidal, another place where there is uh, has been quite a few... Quite a bit of violence. On we go. Namely regions of Timbuktu and Kidal. I should like to commend the Malian government's remarkable cooperation with my mandate throughout my visits. Allow me also to thank the United Nations system for its human, logistical and security support in particular, which I benefited from during my successive visits. I should also like to... Okay, this is all very... Very well, very well done. Yeah, so, dans ce mandat a pu bénéficier. Sometimes you fall into the trap of, well, not really a trap, but sometimes the first reaction might be to say that it's benefited from, which is okay. It's better maybe to say to bénéficier, that we've received. Maybe sounds a bit more natural uh, in English. Thank the government in particular, namely the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the president of the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission. Okay, he, she gives, the minister gives a few the names of some of the sort of personalities, the, uh, the officials. This is a package that often comes up in a lot of these conflicts. Uh, the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission. Just ex just be prepared for that one. Just know that that's almost uh, whenever there's like been a civil, you know, in a conflict, there's usually the an establishment of this Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Committee. Um, I don't know if you can call it, you could probably get away with calling it a TJR commission. 
you know, I'm a big fan of, of, of acronyms. Anything to make my work a bit easier. I've got, I reckon you could get away with a TJR commission. Maybe first time for truth, justice, reconciliation. And then if you've got a really hard text, maybe just go afterwards to T, the TJR commission. Let's play on. The president of the National Human Rights Commission and many other state representatives. I also had a very fruitful meeting with the former president, Amadou Tumani Toure, from the central region, and the high representative of the African Union mission for Mali and the Sahel. Okay, there's a mention of our former president, the guy who was originally toppled in the, the first coup back in, what, 2012? Amadou Toure. Okay. And then we have the high representative. A UN mission, actually. So it's it's called uh, the Afri so the African Union mission to Mali and the Sahel, Misahel. So uh, got to admit, it's not one I've come across before, um, but uh, that may crop up whenever you're doing Mali text. The African Union was a big tends to be a big player when it comes to uh, conflict in Africa. Not surprisingly. General Pierre Thier. Also the special representative of the UN Secretary General, Mohamed Saleh Amadif, with whom I held briefing and debriefing sessions that were extremely useful and that helped my understanding of the situation in Mali. Okay, so the he, the speaker adds in a few names here. Um, that aren't in the text. Just to one slight tip, you know, if you hear a name, you're not expecting it, a name comes along. Uh, I can't remember what his full name was. Um, if you can just sort of get his job title and the surname, like a stab at least is his, uh, his surname, you know, that you don't have to give him the full name. You can even, even if you get the, 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 the job, the, the job title right, you can even do without a name sometimes. I also met representatives of the Diplomatic Corps and United Nations bodies. And our dialogue and information sharing. Um, just a quick tip here. Organisme de, de Nations Unies. Um, Organisme de Nations Unies. So you can say UN organs or UN entities. You wouldn't say organisms, I don't think. Just, uh, organs or entities. Good were also very use fruitful, rather. I met representatives of civil society, including youth associations and victims associations in northern Mali, representatives of the Dogon and Pearl communities. Okay, so the Dogon and the Pearl are two of the um, ethnicities there in Mali. In fact, we uh, switch back quickly to our... Uh, CIA World Factbook. I'll show you here the ethnic groups. Um, maybe I should have mentioned this before. So you see the Bambara ethnicity is the, the, the most uh, prevalent in Mali, 33.33. And there you have here, you've got the Dogon, 8.7. And the Pearl... Maybe they're be maybe they come under Bell. I'm not certain. One point seven. Um, yeah, there you go. That's the use. Showing how useful the CIA World Factbook can be sometimes. Okay, go back. And representatives of the platform and coordination of Azerod movements. My two visits would not have been a success without the technical, logistical and security support of the United Nations system in Mali. And special mention goes to the Human Rights and Protection Division of MINUSMA. This is all very good um, from, from Erin. Mention special, special mention, special, special thanks. Mm, this is all good. During my fourth and fifth missions, I focused in particular on the following major issues. Firstly... Efforts made by the Malian authorities and their international partners to improve the protection of civilians, in particular in the centre and the north of Mali, where intercommunity violence has reached alarming le levels. 
Okay, um, up here. Okay, so Aaron here said intercommunity violence. I think the, um, the, the, the sort of the phrase they tend to use is uh, intercommunal violence. Uh, intercommunal. I guess you, I mean it's like sectarian violent violence. You, you could probably say it a stretch, but make your life easier. It's probably the bit, yeah. Just make your life easier. So intercommunal is what they uh, they, they like to use. Secondly, concrete decisions made to put an end to impunity, which fuels human rights violations and abuses, and the vicious circle of violence in certain regions. This is very nice. Um, I think we've mentioned this before in other texts. So, violation et atteinte, so violations and abuse, abuses. So she says uh, this fuels uh, human rights violations and abuses. Uh, that's, that's very good. Um, the technical difference, again, I may have mentioned, so violations are committed by the state and uh, atteint, uh, abuses are committed by, well, non-state actors. I, I believe that is the official distinction. Third, the results obtained in the field of transitional justice for the serious humanitarian situation, which does not receive enough attention from peace workers uh, okay, this bit here. Nat ne fait pas suffisamment l'objet d'attention. This is good. Hasn't received sufficient attention. That's just how they like to say it in French. N'a pas fait suffisamment l'objet. I mean, I guess he could say it in English. It hasn't been subject to enough attention. That sounds ugly. So what uh, what Erin said, it hasn't received enough attention. Uh, acteur de la paix. Uh, I think you can just say uh, actors or... Uh, stakeholders is always a favourite word. Um, we like using stakeholders, very UNE sounding. Fifth, the participation of civil society, in particular women and young people, in the peace and reconciliation process. On the protection of civilians, in particular in the north of Mali, on the whole, as I explained in my report, the absence of Local and local administrative and security services in most regions in the centre and north of Mali has placed civilian populations in greater positions of vulnerability. Okay, uh, on the whole, that's very good actually for for globalement. I tend to say overall, but on the whole, is I, I, I like that's very natural English sounding. Uh, and then here, um, do, uh, okay, it says here. here L'absence d'autorité administratif et de sécurité locale dans la plupart des régions du centre et du nord du pays a accru la, page, la, vulnérabilité, la vulnérabilité. So I tend to say with, for accru has heightened the vulnerability, but again, you can also use, you know, has compounded the vulnerability, has exacerbated the vulnerability. So. Always, you know, those words always, I, you know, come together. They're, they're good synonyms to have in these sorts of contexts. However, I welcome the gradual redeployment of the reconstituted Malian armed forces in Kidal, Gao and Timbuktu, as well as the acceleration of the disarmament, demobilisation and reintegration, DDR, process. Okay, this is, this is good. Um, yes, yeah, so she says the uh, les forces armées maliennes reconstituées, yeah, the the reconstituted Malian armed forces. That's that's good. That's a good way of doing it, actually. Um, and then here, so this is a favourite um, package of, um, of of notion of ideas here: désarmement, démobilisation et réintégration. So that's this is the famous DDR, as she says. So she gives it the full name first, and then DDR. And wherever there is DDR, there often tends to be uh, your SSR somewhere close by, uh, which is uh, security sector uh, reform. And I, th I think that will come up somewhere during the statement. And the creation of an economic development zone in the north of the country. These constitute important steps in the implementation of the agreement for peace and reconciliation in Mali. 
In addition, the coordination of our Okay, so this is the this accord pour la paix et réconciliation au Mali. This is the Algiers Accords that we spoke of earlier. This agreement that brings together the sort of three main factions: uh, the authority, the government, la coordination, and la plateforme. As the world movement has established a mechanism to promote human rights. Although I have noted some respite in northern Mali. Uh, this word éclairci, uh, okay, she says respite, yeah, maybe, maybe bright spots, perhaps, maybe closer to the, to the, uh, the, the meaning. In the area of security and human rights, in central Mali, I'm very concerned that the situation is deteriorating without a response sufficient enough to protect civilian populations. Okay, so yeah, I've noted with, cons so yeah, constater avec préoccupation is a sort of classic word. say. I've noted with, I note with concern the situation has se degrades, has deteriorated, you can just say has worsened but deteriorated. Uh, is nice. Um, no adequate response has been given to protect the civilians. I have also observed that in this region, security, judicial and administrative failures have combined with disastrous effects. Yeah, fa so defi uh, uh, yeah. defiance, she says, Fail, uh, failures, so maybe failings is perhaps like, the best English um, word there, or, or shortcomings, security, judicial, administrative shortcomings, um, which generate both a viol a mass violence and impunity. Namely, into community violence breaking out, serious human rights violations, and above all, impunity. In fact, in this region, particularly that of Mopti, civilian populations are increasingly trapped by transnational criminal groups. Extremely Let's just remind ourselves, perhaps, of where Mopti is. Just always, you know, get to uh, revert to the political map sometime. If you can picture what the country looks like. Uh, so there's Mopti just there. There you go. Right, I guess you'd say right in the centre. Well, that's right. This is Mopti. Um, the province of Mopti, and there's the Mop Mopti town. So uh, that's been one of the main sort of hot spots. Armed groups and armed militias based on community membership, which in Okay, some interesting uh, words here. Let me just see what, I, I didn't catch what she said for piégé. peace and reconciliation process. On the protection of civilians, in particular in the north of Mali, on the whole, as I explained in my report, the absence of an armed forces in Kidal development zone in the north of the country, these constitute important steps in the implementation of the agreement for peace and reconciliation in Mali. In addition, the that in this region, Security, judicial, and administrative failures have combined with disastrous effects, namely into community violence breaking out, serious human rights violations, and above all, impunity. In fact, in this region, particularly that of Mopti, civilian populations are increasingly trapped by transnational criminal groups. Okay, so yes, but on the plus en plus piégé, they're increasingly trapped. Oh, they're increasingly uh, cornered by these transnational criminal groups. You could get really fancy, you know, they're, they're increasingly at the mercy of transnational criminal groups. Maybe it's going as a bit of a stretch, maybe, but yeah, any, you know, cornered trap. Extremist armed groups and armed militias based on community membership 
which increasingly ensured the control of this zone. Ok, ça y est, les milices armées fondées sur l'appartenance communautaire. So yeah, she's basically, he's basically talking about, you know, ethnic based armed groups. Community, but I think, yeah, maybe in English it sounds better, ethnic based armed groups. Qui assure de plus en plus le contrôle de cette zone, who, who, are in, who increasingly um, are in control of this zone. Of this region, perhaps. Where economic problems linked to transhumans and the theft of cattle have become one of the greatest challenges of the region. A couple of interesting words here. So, enjeu économique, I, I would like to hear here uh, the economic challenges as opposed to problems. Enjeu, I always tend to, my go to word is almost always um, challenge. Uh, transhumans is just uh, transhumans, actually. Uh, and that is... Uh, transhumans is um, when the pastoralists move their... Um, move their cattle, their livestock, uh, from one land to another. So basically, tres can, I guess it leads to trespassing. Uh, and then here you have, okay, le vol de bétail... Okay, so I mean, the the basic translation is you know the theft of of uh, of livestock, um, theft of cattle. You say cattle rustling, sounds a bit old fashioned, you know, from the days of the Wild West, John Wayne cowboy films. But that's quite I, I find it quite catchy expression, cattle rustling. So they've increasingly become challenges in the region. I noted that armed violence against a backdrop of community tension has increased sharply and that armed groups take advantage of the absence of the state in these areas to exploit and exacerbate risks between communities. This is nice, uh, some good words here. Les, les fractures, les, the, the rifts in bet between communities. Um schisms between communities, divisions between communities, but I think Erin said actually rifts is the, is the best. An infernal cycle of violence and reprisals follow one another endlessly in this central region. For yeah, uh, follow one another in this region, that's good. You know, I follow, uh, follow hot on each other's heels, but I guess you're probably not going to, you might struggle to have the time to say that, so that's the idea. For example, according to UN figures, from January to March 2020, armed groups based on community membership and violent extremist groups were responsible for 36.45 and 17.2% respectively of the 598 violations and abuses of human rights. Okay, so there's a lot of figures in this. So I forgot to mention there's a lot of figures in this text. So it's, very, it's good practice in that respect. So um, she's really, Erin's really tried to get the exact figures. And, but you know what, 36.45, uh, I would just be, to be honest, I, uh, he, look, he speaks. He's quite clear speaker. His mm, speed is sort of middling, but you know. I'd be fine with just saying 36% and 17% of the, well, 590 violations. Again, it, it depends, it sort of, it's a person, it depends on you in the moment you're doing the, um, the interpretation, how you feel, how, uh, how confident, how, um, if you're in good form or not. So, but she, she's, tr she's trying to go for the exact figures here. Documented. Signatory and non-signatory armed groups of the peace agreement were responsible for 10.03%. Okay, she gets the 10.03, uh, that's very good. Of cases. We must note yeah. the manifest powerlessness of the Malian armed forces and MINUSMA in guaranteeing appropriate security for civilian populations of this central area. 
Uh, okay, this is that's a very good the one word here. Yeah. Well, prendre acte is it? Is uh, um, you might not necessarily know. so prendre acte is you know to take note of to take note of uh, un puissance manifeste the blatant power uh, powerlessness the I guess you say the manifest powerlessness. I was appalled by the attack on the... Oh, I like that. That's good. I have to stop it there. J'ai été consterné. I was appalled. That's very good. I was horrified. The 4th of February, 14th of February, by armed individuals on the village of, of Gasugu in the Mopti region, at least 33 people were killed, 3 were injured, and 20 are missing. Okay. More figures here. Porté disparu. Probably said it before. Yeah, I think the most natural thing to say in English is just to say have gone missing. You don't with these sort of things. You don't yet have to worry about the distinction between being disappeared and missing. So you can just go with missing. I was shocked to learn that before the attack, the detachment of Malian armed forces that had previously provided security for the village had withdrawn despite the fact that they had been warned of an imminent attack on the village. That's all, that's all very good. Um, yeah, they have been providing secu uh, la sécurité, provided security. Uh, maybe la veille, la veille de l'attaque, you know, on, on, the, on the eve of the attack. This may be a bit nicer than before the attack. I could mention similar attacks, for example, an attack that took place in March 2019 on the same village. Okay, this is a good tactic she's used there because she missed the, 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 the specific day, the 23rd, but yeah, March 2019, that's, that's absolutely fine. At least 157 members of the Pearl community, including 46 children, were killed. Secondly, an attack in June 2019 on the village of Sobanda killed 35 members of the Dogon community, including 22 children under the age of 12. Yeah, they get, she gets all these figures right, um, which, is, which, is, which is good. Almost everyone that I met, including representatives of the state, as well as... Uh, in interesting word... Well, Interesting. Interlocutor. I, I increasingly have just gone with saying interlocutors. That, that seems to be becoming increasingly um, current at the UN. So I, I'm, I will often now just say interlocutor. You think it's perhaps a bit of a, a, a calc, but it, it's, it's, it's okay. You feel free to use it. Yes. The Defence and Security Forces stress that perpetrators of previous similar attacks in different regions have never been brought to account. Okay, um, répondre de leurs actes, so she says uh, brought to account. Um, I like to go with something similar, it's like held accountable. So one or the other. You want to get some, you want to get that account in, I think. The cancer of impunity is one of the aggravating factors of the current violence and confusion of the security and political situation in Mali. Furthermore, as indicated in my previous report, counter-terrorism operations... Yeah, she says, okay, operation, they say anti-terrorist in the original, but counter-terrorist, that's, that's, that's a good, in English, that sounds best, counter-terrorism, counter-terrorist operations. carried out by Malian Defence and Security Forces in the region have led to serious human rights violations. According to UN figures, from January to March 2020, the Malian National Defence and Security Forces, some of which operate as part of the G5 Sahel Joint Force... Okay, this is very good. Yeah, the G5 Sahel Joint Force, which is made up of... So yeah, the G5 Sahel Joint Force, which is made up of um, 
Niger, Mauritania. Um, I'm going to have to cheat here. I did look it up. So Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, Mauritania, and Niger. Responsible for at least 36.45% of documented human rights violations. These include at least 119 extrajudicial executions and around 30 forced disappearances. Okay, gets the numbers pretty damn close. So this is disparition forcée. This is a enforced disappearance, uh, as opposed to just going missing. As I say, there's this distinct legal distinction. So you can sometimes talk about e if you if enforced disappearances are getting talked about a lot in a text. If it's about enforced disappearance, you can sometimes just call it ED. Here, I would just go with enforced disappearance. Though. Despite the gravity of the situation I've described, I nonetheless welcome the various initiatives cited in my report that have been taken by the Malian authorities to provide a solution to this violence, which is set against the backdrop of community tensions. Oh yes, I wanted to just go back. There's one thing I think I missed. Oh yes, one thing I missed. Let's take you back here. This sentence here. Les opérations antiterroristes menées par les forces de défense de sécurité maliennes dans cette région auraient conduit. Uh, this, I bring this to your attention just because of the tense used. Uh, so it's a bit of a, um, a bit of a nuance, if you like. You know, this is the tense they use in newspaper articles. I, I can't remember what she said exactly, but the, uh, in, the in the original, uh, but it's. Uh, they are said to have they are said to have carried out uh, serious human rights violations. So there is an important nuance. Um, it's not, he's not saying they actually did carry them out, but the idea is that they were alleged to have carried it, carried them out. So you need to listen out for that uh, that ore, that um, conditional when they use it. Okay, and then the, the, we had this paragraph down here. Uh, despite the gravity of the situation just described, I want to uh, commend the various initiatives cited in my report taken by the authorities to get, bring a solution to the violence uh, on the backdrop of community tensions. against the backdrop, if you, if you like. Progress and challenges in the fight against impunity. I note that limited but commendable progress has been made in this area. No. Yeah, that's a nice word for louable, commendable. Um, it's, it's good to have a couple of, uh, of alternatives here. So I have commendable, praiseworthy is another option. To believe it, the operation of the Judicial Department specialised in... in Specialising in combating corruption and economic crimes. Uh, okay, so Paul Judiciaire. Uh, you don't actually have to do anything fancy. You can just call it a judiciary poll. It's one of these sort of... The terminology they use in, in, in sort of peacekeeping operations or whatever. So you, you don't have to do anything fancy with it. You just call it a judiciary poll. And you've got polls in other sectors as well which has yielded tangible results. Unfortunately, most of the perpetrators of violations of human rights and international humanitarian law go unpunished. Okay, that's nice. Uh, perp auteur, perpetrators. Uh, droit international humanitaire, you can say, you know, IHL, everyone, you know that. A good, that's a good little cheat here, you know, if you're going to save yourself time. Uh, and to rest impuni, go unpunished, right? Judicial authorities have assured us that investigations were underway for recent violations, but that due to the security situation with victims and witnesses with fearing reprisals, the judicial process has practically come to a standstill. Okay. Uh, yep, the craignons des represailles, fearing reprisals, exactly. 
again, Chaza is another word you don't need to, you can say retaliation, I mean, but again, sometimes, you know, there's no no set rule with calc, sometimes they, they work, sometimes they don't, in this case, you know, the Chaza reprisals, it works nicely. Uh, judicial process is slow, or another good uh, useful synonym I sometimes use for slow, just because slow is a bit of a, it's a bit of a boring word, isn't it? Sluggish. Transitional justice, then. I welcome the progress made by the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission. According to information received, as of 20th of March 2020, the Commission had collected over 16,000 testimonies. Very nice, very nice. It had collected over 16,000 testimonies. Okay, so here she doesn't bother trying to get the exact number, just but she knows it's over 16,000. So nicely done. 16% of which were made by women, and that is since its creation. So she gets six, 16, she had 16, so 60%. Two public hearings are scheduled for June. The Commission will hold a total of six public hearings. Okay, uh, audition, as she rightly says, uh, is a hearing. Audition. Public hearings here. The humanitarian situation, then, in particular concerning children. The deterioration of the security situation has contributed to continued deterioration of the humanitarian situation. According to information received, the number of IDPs has more than doubled for the second year in a row. OK, that's well done. Um, IDPs, personnes déplacées à l'intérieur de leur propre pays. All that can just be... Um can just be distilled down to um, IDPs, uh, has doubled for the second consecutive year, second year running. Let's say, let's see how she does with the numbers here now. This figure was 84,000 in January 2019, it rose to 200,000 in December 2019, and finally to 218,000 in March 2020. Pretty good. She does, yeah. She does get some pretty accurate. She doesn't waste too much energy trying to get the exact figure. She knows the ones she hears, she gets. But if she doesn't get the exact figure with like two thousand one hundred and seven seven five one, she gets it close enough. Moreover, according to young figures, the number of schools that are closed or non-operational due to insecurity increased from. 716 in November 2018, to over 1,000 in December 2019, and finally to 1,150 in March 2020, affecting over 300,000 children. Very good, again with the figures here, over 300,000 children. I think 300,000 is pretty acceptable when it comes to 330,000, it's near enough. In addition to being deprived of their right to education, these idle children are exposed to risk of, risks of violence, yeah, so privé de leur droit, she's deprived. Again, here it's the calc, isn't it? The closest English calc is privé, deprived. I think denied perhaps sounds a little bit better uh, in English. But deprived is okay as well. Uh, oh, wasif, yeah, they've become idle. Uh, they've got nothing to do, wasif. And abuse, including recruitment by armed groups, militias, extremist movements and criminal groups operating in the country. On the participation of civil society, in particular women and youth, in the peace and reconciliation process. As I underlined in my report, significant progress has been made in the implementation of the Agreement for Peace and Reconciliation in Mali since the beginning of 2019. All this last section, these last few sentences have been very done very nicely, very good textbook stuff. It's not particularly difficult, but all done very nicely. I welcome the fact that the National Inclusive Dialogue was concluded in Bamako in December 2019 with the adoption of four resolutions and a series of recommendations involving the participation of civil society organisations, including women's groups and youth groups in particular. Okay, and um, so there's, I, I don't know if he said it in the original, I can't remember. Um, 
participation des organisations de la civil, société civile, y compris des groupes de femmes et de jeunes, et surtout de la CMA. Uh, that's funny, I mean, um, French, um, they aren't big on acronyms, unlike in, Engl in English. They, they, they tend to give the full name of the, uh, of the organizations involved. Sometimes then they can catch you out uh, when they actually do use uh, the acronym. So this is the Coordination. The Coordination de, du Mouvement de, de Azawad. So they sometimes have to be careful with the, the French uh, acronyms. However, I regret that in general, the participation of women in the peace and reconciliation process remains marginal, especially in decision-making bodies. Yeah, the les organes de prise de décision, so in the decision-making organs, entities. Um, I tend to go with entities myself, oh, but oh, organ bodies, organs, bodies, entities. Choose one that you feel most comfortable with. Sometimes I feel strange saying the organ. We often talk so the Security Council is definitely the an organ, the General Assembly. Outside of that, yeah, for some reason organ sounds a bit strange sometimes. I'll say entity or body. For by way of example, the monitoring committee of the Agreement for Peace and Reconciliation in Mali does not include a single woman. Um, a comité de suivi. Uh, I would prefer, I think we want to hear follow-up there, the follow-up committee, um, generally, with Sweevi. Women only represent 4% of the members of the subcommittee of this monitoring committee. They make up 3% of the National Commission for DDR, 6 then we have Désarmement, Démobilisation, Réintégration. So she's just gone straight for the DDR Commission, the Commission on DDR, which is very good. Percent of the National Council for Security Sector Reform. There we go. I told you it would, when you get DDR, the SSR won't be far behind. This is Réforme du Secteur de la Sécurité, Security Sector uh, Reform. Um, and I know there's a concept called... Um, have a look, let's look it up actually. Uh, SS triple R. Or is it DD triple R? Reintegration. Okay, somebody call it actually uh, DD Triple R. So there you go, the full list: disarmament, demobilization, repatriation, reintegration, and resettlement. Okay, so sometimes it's just the first three, the DDR, but also the DD Triple R. You will sometimes hear also. Twenty percent of the Truth, Justice, and Reconciliation Commission, and one and five percent in interim administrations at regional levels. Recommendations. I strongly recommend that the Malian authorities step up their efforts in the fight against impunity. Um, just a quick word here. Notamment comes up a lot in French text. So I, we tend, I tend to like to just say, to say the old interalia, the old Latin expression seems to be the, um, the favourite rendering of notamment in general at sort of big meetings, important meetings. And bring to justice all perpetrators of violations of international humanitarian law and human rights, whatever their status and their political, religious or ethnic affiliation. Just to take note here, violations du droit international humanitaire et des droits de l'homme. These two often come as a package. So you've got, on the one hand, you've got international humanitarian law, IHL, and you've also got international human rights law. So that droit, this word droit, I believe it's 
it refers both to the international humanitaire and the droit de l'homme, so international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Also that they continue to actively engage in peace building, mediation, dialogue and reconciliation initiatives with all Malian citizens to successfully put an end to hostilities and achieve lasting peace. Here we go again with another calc that works fine in English. Cessation des hostilités, to reach a cessation of hostilities. That's the sort of set phrase that, that's used, so feel free to use it. And une paix durable, uh, I tend to go with a lasting peace. Does she say sustainable peace? I can't remember. But a lasting peace is, is, tends to be the best uh, solution for that. To actively engage in the implementation of recommending recommendations stemming from the 2018 UPR and treaty bodies too. Organ, organ conventionnel, uh, the UN, I'm sure we've probably come across this before, the treaty bodies. Okay, the various conventions, the committees on the various conventions, the various Geneva Conventions, rights of persons with disabilities, CEDAW, racial discrimination, all that set. Okay. I recommend that G5 Sahel states adopt a holistic, regional and coordinated so, approach. Holistic approach, yeah, they like saying holistic at the UN, so... Uh, Sometimes, uh, I, know, I know some people prefer to say something like uh, comprehensive. I, it sound, comprehensive sounds better, but holistic is, is fine, actually. Holistic is just fine. To security and human rights issues, given the similarity of the issues they are facing, I recommend that the Economic Community of West African States and the African Union, in cooperation with the international community... So here's what we were talking about in the introduction. So, uh, the CDAO, uh, ECOWAS, big player in that part, the, in, the, in that sort of part of, the, of Africa, Economic Community of West African States. So, and they, 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 as I say, often have their own military missions. They're not just an economic body, as the name might suggest. So. find urgent and effective means to put an end to the violence and serious violations and abuses of human rights in central Mali. I recommend that the Security Council reassesses the security situation in the region, the central region, and adjust the mandate of MINISMA. Yep, re uh, de re -evaluate. So it's very nice how she says to reassess. I always find uh, evaluate for evaluate. Another calc we're talking here. Uh, I always find that a bit of a shh. I, I don't like evaluate. I prefer assess, to reassess the security situation. But again, evaluate's okay. I strongly recommend that the Human Rights Council keeps abreast of the issue of the human rights situation in Mali. That's very nice, isn't it? To keep abreast. So, uh, de rester saisi de la question. I was going to say, you can remain seized of a question or the Security Council is often their sort of set phrase is seized of the matter or apprised of the matter. Again, whatever you're most comfortable with. So keeps abreast of the situation. Um, I think I I would perhaps maybe go with just seized. Whatever whatever you whatever is most you you're most comfortable with. And continues to support the mandate of the independent expert to allow continued assistance, as well as the monitoring and evaluation of progress in the field of the promotion and protection of human rights in Mali. Thank you. And there we have it, the, the end. So, okay, she's gone here for the evaluation of progress. Again, maybe an assessment, follow-up and assessment uh, of uh, progress. So, uh, some useful ideas, hopefully, you, you, you got there. Found some useful vocabulary. Um, so as usual, as I, as I, as I put to conclude, give you my uh, three highlights uh, from this text. So for my three concluding highlights of today's uh, riveting episode uh, on this day, 3rd of November, what a day. 
Um, number one, it's what we actually talked about before. It's not actually in the text. So it's taking you back to the introduction. I do want you to get this notion into your head of, uh, as I say, the root causes of a lot of the conflicts uh, in, in Africa. It's um, about pastoralists or nomad nomadic populations against settled populations, okay? Settled com uh, settlement communities and the way that the, uh, the nomads tend to pass through their lands during the various uh, seasons with their, uh, with their flocks uh, or herds, whatever. So that's uh, highlight number one. Highlight number two is these two um, sort of acronyms I was giving you to remember as a package. Um, DDR, uh, demobilization, um, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. Uh, we'll just leave it at that. You don't, don't worry about the other two R, R's for now. Together with the other one that comes often as a package with it, the SSR security sector reform. And also, while we're at it, why not uh, Truth Reconciliation, Truth Justice Reconciliation Committees? As I say, those three often uh, tend to come together. And my final, my third and uh, final highlight uh, would be yeah, the idea of, in, uh, again, conflict in Africa. Uh, in this notion of intercommunal violence, um, again, I mean it's a calc because obviously in the French it's similar, um, but that's that's really the expression that they do like to use when discussing this sort of thing, intercommunal violence. So don't be afraid, as I say, to just use the calc uh, in this uh, in this context. So that brings us to an end uh, of this episode. Um, Hope you've enjoyed it. Certain, it's been much more enriching than watching any any other events going on today. Um, so just to conclude, I want you just to remember. I always have to remember to tell you to do this. Uh, press the thumbs up button uh, if you haven't subscribed already. Uh, consider subscribing. Just press that little subscribe button on the screen. Uh, I will, uh, as I say, I'll put in the description box all the various links to the recordings and texts that you need. And I'll link up to other similar statements so that you can sort of do these uh, recordings as in a package with other similar ones. So you can you know use the same vocabulary. And uh, that's about it for today. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I declare episode six, is it six or is it seven? Six, the interpretation station Closed. See you next time. The train is now leaving the interpretation station. We hope you enjoyed your visit. Until next time, folks.